Greetings, humanoids. Adam and Akbar, as always, in our studio. Welcome to episode 21. We are in module four of our course on philosophy and climate change. We're talking about climate policies, and I feel so excited because now you have enough background uh, information and enough kind of conceptual tools that we can just talk about specific policies and you kind of know the frameworks that you can put these into. So keep in your mind, for example, the social process, uh, the decision process, the problem orientation, all of these things you can use to think through some of the things we're going to talk about with the Paris Climate Agreement. Why this one? Well, this is really it in terms of the international treaties governing climate change policy commitments. So this is one we've got to talk about today. Uh, the objective will be to just get into some of the broad strokes of it and not the details, but I'll give you some information on where to find details. First, though, new segment. Akbar, Akbar tells a joke. <sighs> Akbar says, knock, knock, and I say, who's there? Akbar says, why is climate policy so hard? And I say, why is climate policy hard who? Akbar says, because it is a collective action problem where the short-term costs are felt by powerful actors like the carbon industrial complex, and the benefits are typically diffuse and long-term. I say, Akbar, that's not how not knock jokes work. <laughs> and Akbar says, ah! <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's really bad. Um, okay, <laughs> let's get into it. What are we gonna do today? Um, understand the Paris Climate Agreement, basically. Uh, a little bit on how we categorize climate policies, a little history and context, a little bit on the content of the agreement, making sense of it, and then of course a note on how the U.S. has announced its plans to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement. So again, this is the most important and, and in some ways really the only significant international climate policy agreement out there at this time. Uh, we've talked about, so just a quick note here. Look, we talked last time about categorizing climate policies in different ways. So one way is the levers that you can pull, right, and the Kaya identity. The other way we talked about is the, what kinds of intervention, mitigation, geoengineering, adaptation. But let's also keep in mind that we can categorize policies by the parties who are involved. So in this case, this is in an international treaty, so we're talking about nation states. And... <clears throat> You can think about private sector, public sector, and of course, these are always gonna be intertwined. And when you're talking about the public sector, we're thinking now on the biggest scale, international. In future lectures, like on the Green New Deal, we'll get down to the national scale at the US. And I also then wanna talk about state, local, even hyper-local, that is community level or individual things, policies or actions that you can take. So just, to, just keep in mind, there's different ways to categorize climate policies. For this one, we might wanna think of this types of actors categorization. And here we're looking at an international scene. Um, yeah, I forgot to put that one there. So yes, this is all stuff to keep in mind for later, especially when we talk about individual moral responsibilities and collective action. So the question of who actually has a responsibility to do what? In this context, we're saying, well, nation states have responsibilities to primarily mitigate their emissions. A little bit of context. You know about the United Framework Convention on Climate Change already, uh, got going in 1992. Um, and you know that they have this goal because we've used it many times in our problem orientation, right? Stabilizing greenhouse gas uh, emissions in an attempt to avoid dangerous interference in the climate system. So some of this is review, right? It really, what, what it is, is a framework. The UNFCCC is a framework for countries to get together and commit to pathways and specific targets to reach this overarching goal of stabilizing greenhouse gas concentrations. I think we've also mentioned that the member states will meet annually at what's called the Conference of the Parties or COP to discuss their targets, how they're gonna achieve them, the responsibilities of the different parties, how they're gonna measure and standardize and be transparent about their commitments and all of those things. Now in 97, uh, the Kyoto Protocol was really in some ways the first legally binding uh, international obligations set up under this framework. It was initially a commitment by developed nations to stabilize emissions at 1990 levels by 2000. 
that framing though was quickly deemed insufficient. And what's really interesting and sad about the Kyoto Protocol, not only the US never ratified it, it didn't have any effect on China at all. And in fact, uh, shortly between 97 and I don't know, 2005 or so, China became the number one greenhouse gas emitter around the world. And it, you could make a case that the Kyoto Protocol had absolutely no effect whatsoever, whatsoever on, on uh, emissions. Um, let's fast forward a little bit to COP16 in 2010, where this goal of two degrees above pre-industrial levels was really first set into uh, practice. Then you jump to 2015, that's where we're gonna be. COP21, which is the Paris Agreement, they agreed to well below two degrees as their target, striving for 1.5 degrees. This entered into a force on November 4th, 2016. A note on this little graph here before I forget, the conference of the parties is divided into different kinds of parties and it's somewhat complex, but basically, well, uh, this is too simplistic, but you basically have developed and developing nations. And if you think about your social process and the participants, think about developed nations who have had a long history of emitting carbon dioxide and developing nations that have much lower economic development uh, levels. And it seems apparent, I think, to everybody involved in this, that there has to be some sort of different standards applied to those different kinds of countries. But categorizing countries into developed or developing is really no longer a workable thing with just those two buckets. So that's why it gets complicated, but just a note on that. Okay, so what's in the agreement? Well, I pulled out maybe, I think I got nine things here. You know, it's, it's as you can imagine, it's complex, but really there's kind of a simplistic core to it. So they have this long-term temperature goal. Um, there's a commitment to peaking greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible in achieving climate neutrality by 2050. That's net neutral. So balancing our anthropogenic sources and sinks. So if we were to say overshoot with our sources, we'd have to have some sort of carbon dioxide removal. Remember a little bit of geoengineering to balance that out. So basically net neutral by 2050. Um, mitigation is probably the biggest piece of this all the parties committed to what's called NDCs, nationally determined contributions, that crucially are supposed to at least ratchet up over time because look, the initial things they committed to would not achieve that goal of net neutrality by 2050. There's no debate about that. But the idea was, well, we could ratchet up our commitments over time as innovation and incentives kick in. And there are different standards for these different parties, right? So also there's a little bit in there about sinks and reservoirs. All parties are encouraged to enhance and protect sinks and reservoirs like forests. There's a cooperative uh, portion of it where the parties can actually make deals. One country could say, I'm gonna do more than actually what I need to do for my NDC in exchange uh, for something you could give me. And another country said, I will do less, but I'll give you something in return, right? So they wanted to facilitate deal-making there's also adaptation built into this. The goal of enhancing adaptive capacity, strengthening resilience and reducing vulnerability to climate change in the context of the temperature goal of the agreement. Somewhat broad, but as you can imagine, there's more details fleshed out in the actual agreement. I just wanted you to know it's not purely mitigation. In fact, this was part of the controversy, how much and how to build adaptation into the agreement. It was part of the negotiation. And then there's these financing, uh, tech and capacity building support components of it. Essentially frameworks for, whereby the developed nations assist the developing nations through, for example, technology transfers, capacity building, and even this financial mechanism, which we'll see came into play with the U.S. withdrawal. And then I've got to move this thing to see what did I put down there? Oh yes, uh, public education and awareness as a part of it too. So a lot in there, but the NDCs, the mitigation part is really the, the key probably. Oh, sorry, one more thing, transparency um, on the implementation and the, God dang it, now I have to move this again. Back bar, help me out. Oh, compliance measures. Oh yeah, think about the decision process here. That's what I was gonna say. Um, whether it's good or bad, the UNFCCC really doesn't have a lot of control over nation states. Nation states are sovereign. So even though you could say these are binding commitments, um, 
Not really. <laughs> so the countries have to be transparent about what they're doing, but actually implementing this and getting people to comply with it, that's always tricky when you have na sovereign nation states making these treaties, right? And that's actually some of the precariousness of an agreement like this. I won't spend time on this, but surprise, surprise, this is from Carbon Brief. You know it's one of my favorite uh, climate sense makers. Um, this just gives you a sense of what the uh, NDCs look like. And uh, just look at China, for example. By the way, China, look, 23.7% of all greenhouse gas emissions. So China almost, in fact, really, I think now is even over a quarter of the total of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. So you can see in every case, each country commits to certain uh, emissions reductions targets, which are pinned to some sort of baseline year. So China says, um, a peak in carbon dioxide emissions of 2030, blah, blah, blah. Here you go. Cut emissions per unit of GDP. See how they put that? By 60 to 65% of 2005 levels. Uh, the US also pegged our emissions target to 2005 levels. So we're gonna get 28% below that by 2025. So that's kind of the language they used um, to formulate those and standardize them so that you could be you could have metrics to track them and be transparent about that and hold countries accountable for what they promise to do, right? Um, also surprise, David Roberts, um, go and check out, I've got something linked here. If you want to find good interpretive analysis of this, um, look, it's not a solution, he says, because if countries met their pledges, it would still mean a 3.5 degree increase by 2100 over pre-industrial levels, which is not good, right? But what was really revolutionary, he said, is this kind of a conceptual rethinking. And this is what he thinks was important about the Paris Climate Agreement. We went from an old architecture where the developed nations had almost all the responsibility. Think about the Kyoto Protocol, how at the time didn't apply to China really at all. Um, and that there would be these science-based emission targets for each developed nation. Well, that's changed a bit. And you can go ahead and read this article. It's not, not required for anybody in the class, but just if you want further good reading. It's changed because now all nations have to be involved, regardless of the developed developing category, which is really getting hard to put countries into, right? Those two buckets. And then I think the other thing he says that's changed is we've gotten more realistic about what the UNFCCC can do. Again, nation states are sovereign. They're only gonna act in their own self-interest. There is no climate czar that can really police effectively what they're gonna do. So the UNFCC had a rethinking, what is our role? And the role is to offer a structure and standards and transparency, right, for how do we get everybody to agree on what the rules will be and how we're gonna track progress, right? That's what the UNFCC can do. And importantly, apply peer pressure, right? So you know, like if you make a, a weight loss goal or something and you say it publicly, you're more likely to live up to it. So the, just the process of countries coming together and signaling, we believe in these shared values and we're gonna make this commitment to do this. That has some moral suasion, that has some soft power push behind it, right? Maybe you would in fact create a self-fulfilling prophecy. That is, you create this perception of progress and everybody's energized, oh my gosh, everybody came together at the Paris Climate Accord and it might create its own reality because now businesses say, this is real, we're gonna get behind it, we're gonna make the innovations and, and we're gonna put the money behind it. And so you just kind of create this positive aura. So this is an interesting piece by David Roberts. I think he's, he may be right about, about that. But make no mistake about it. Um, as they're set now, although again, there's this ratcheting mechanism where it can go up over time and it would have to, to reach our targets. We still have a problem with, by 2019 at least, many nations not meeting their set targets, at least by that four years into it. Um, three or four years. You also have this emissions gap. So look at this top chart. You know, current policy status quo would be bad. We have these pledges with your INDCs or your NDCs would be slightly better, but you've got to do a lot more to reach a two degree and especially a 1.5 degree target. So that's the point of that top graph. And kind of the corollary of that is this uh, production gap 
That is, if you just look at countries' plans to dig fossil fuels out of the ground, well, they are planning a lot more <laughs> than is consistent with a two or a 1.5 degree target. And they're planning less with these pledges in place, but still way too much. So I think everybody recognizes Paris has its strong suits and it is a really important international treaty. But if we really take these two or 1.5 C degree target goals seriously, this treaty alone won't be enough, at least with the indices that are built into it now. Okay, finally, the US withdrawal. I just put this up here. The only thing to take away is look at almost all the countries in red, meaning their signatories, uh, 192 uh, when I grab this from Carbon Brief. But look at the US. Uh, submitted, but exiting the deal, okay? So what's going on with, with that? It's true, I've got linked here the full transcript of President Trump's uh, announcement to withdraw. Uh, a story, you know, I, I find, a, I think a lot of good coverage on this is over at Vox. Um, a tweet from Secretary Pompeo about the withdrawal. That really interesting that actually, it, I don't know what the mechanism is specifically, but it takes a year after the announcement of withdrawing for it to go into effect. And if you know the 2020 election day is November 3rd. So this is set to go into effect one day after the election. Um, I have here the full transcript of his speech. I just pulled a little bit of it. Quote, as president, I can put no other consideration before the well-being of American citizens. The Paris Climate Accord is simply the latest example of Washington entering into an agreement that disadvantages the United States to exclusive benefit of other countries leaving American workers who I love and taxpayers to absorb the cost in terms of jobs lost, lower wages, shuttered factories, and vastly diminished economic production, end quote. I just have to leave it there because we're out of time for this particular look at climate policy, the Paris Climate Agreement. But I wanted to put that there because going forward, as we talk about other policies and as we talk about the US presidential election, we ought to take seriously some of these evaluations of these policies. You know, These are strong accusations that this is going to be economically costly, it's going to cost jobs. Well, is that the case? Right? I can't get into that right now, but let's keep that as an open question going forward as we get into some of the more details and eventually more into uh, national politics in the U.S. around climate change. Okay, but that's enough for now. An attempt to save his sterling reputation, Akbar tells maybe a better joke. One of my favorites, did you hear about the muffins um, two muffins are sitting in the oven, and one muffin says, wow, it's getting hot in here. And the other muffin turns and says, whoa, a talking muffin. <laughs> no, is that, I don't know, maybe that's just because I got, got little kids in the house, and I just, that's the kind of humor that I've got. That's all I got for you. All right, everybody, um, until next time, may the force be with you.